how can we improve economic growth in Pakistan? And regardless of what we've discussed, we have always kept people at the heart of the solution. And that is what the next session is all about. People are a nation's competitive edge. Our next panel is about, a, it's actually a dialogue on developing a national HRD strategy. And for that, the panel members are Sayyid Zulfikar Abbas Bukhari, Minister of State for HRD and Overseas Pakistanis. And Dilip Abbas, MNA and Parliamentary Secretary for Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Khaled Awan, Chairman Transim Group. Sayyid Asad Ali Shah, Chairman Pakistan Refinery Limited. Faraz Khan, Founder Seed and Visiting Professor in Social Enterprise and Innovation, St. Mary's University, London. A round of applause, please. Um, and the session will be moderated by Sajid Aslam, Country Head, Pakistan, ACCA. Thank you. Uh, in terms of time, we have uh, about 48 minutes for the panel, including the Q&A session. Assalamu and thank you for joining us today, and thank you to fellow pan panelists for being here. Uh, I think we will be running like 12 minutes is the the cut at the time, so we will try to cover it in a, in a different way and a little quickly. Uh, I think from a, from an agenda perspective, it's the most important thing is first understand what the HRD, a national HRD we, we are looking for, and then come up with a with the overall strategy that how we're going to deliver that. So to start with that, I think we will uh, we will start with you, Mr. Zulfi, that uh, being responsible from a government side on HRD how you see that agenda and how you link it with creating the 10 million jobs and strengthen the labor market narrative in a, in a PTI manifesto. So what is your view and how you see that agenda shaping up right now? English or English? English. Um, your call. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to everybody here. Uh, first and foremost, we have around 1.5 million youth per annum which comes into a working age um, so meaning over uh, you know in the next uh, three years you're you're looking uh, at around 4.5 million just over the next three years uh, of unemployment coming in if you don't provide them jobs so hence the vision of the prime minister on uh, Imran Khan is um, to create 10 million over the next five years which will gap this or, or give potential to this um, to this overwhelming sort of uh, unemployment potential that's coming um, my in my personal opinion and jo mere ministry mein kaam ho raha hai wo is cheez pe ho raha hai ki hum focus kar rahe hain balki jis pe andeep sahib bhi bahut mehnat kar rahe hain aur involved bhi hain wo ye hai ki vocational and technical training um main samajhta hu ki jo loves hai education उसमें खुद एक एवोल्यूशन आया हुआ है अराउंड द वर्ल्ड और अनफॉर्चुनेटली पाकिस्तान उसमें काफ़ी पीछे है द टर्म एजुकेशन इज़ एवॉल्व ज़रूरत है हमें कि जो एजुकेशन का जो लफ्ज़ है उसको हम फिर से री एग्जामिन करें कि उसमें कौन कौन सी चीज़ें आती हैं जो हम अभी वोकेशनल और टेक्निकल ट्रेनिंग कहते हैं जिस चीज़ को वो क्या अब इस वक्त वोकेशनल टेक्निकल ट्रेनिंग है या वो सिर्फ या वो एजुकेशन में इन्वॉल्व होनी चाहिए टू ब्रिज दिस गैप क्योंकि इफ़ यू लुक एट इफ़ यू लुक एट द टिपिकल लॉन्ग टर्म्स लॉन्ग टर्म सिलेबस ऑफ एजुकेशन और हायर एजुकेशन इज़ वेरी लेंथी एंड इज़ वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू गेट यूथ टू कम ऑन टू इट एंड देन पार्टिसिपेट इट थ्रू टू दी एंड सो वी हैव टू री एग्जामिन आर एजुकेशन सिस्टम वी हैव टू फोकस ऑन एज वोकेशनल एंड टेक्निकल ट्रेनिंग और हमें यह भी एग्जामिन करना है कि कौन से जो जब आप वोकेशनल टेक्निकल ट्रेनिंग की बात करते हैं आपने देखना है कि पाँच साल में कौन से ऐसे स्किल सेट्स हैं जो इस्तेमाल होंगे और कौन से ऐसे हैं जो ऑप्सलीट हो जाएंगे जो इस्तेमाल भी नहीं होंगे पाँच साल बाद तो ये ना हो कि हम तीन साल से एक एक ऐसा इको बनाना चाहें एक एक पर्टिकुलर स्किल सेट के लिए जो शायद तीन या पाँच साल बाद हो ही ना या ऑप्सलीट के अपने शेल्फ लाइफ के आखिर में आ रहा हूँ तो इसकी आइडेंटिफिकेशन सबसे 
زیادہ ضروری ہے دوسری چیز یہ کہ میں سمجھتا ہوں کہ اس میں پرائیویٹ سیکٹر کا بہت بڑا ہاتھ ہے ایک گورنمنٹ ایک تو پہلی بات یہ کہ اسکولز اتنے جلدی بنا نہیں سکتی اتنے زیادہ کہ ہم ان کو ایجوکیٹ کر سکیں تو اس میں پرائیویٹ سیکٹر کی ضرورت ہوگی ووکیشنل ٹریننگ ہم اتنے بنا نہیں سکتے کہ اس میں بھی ہمیں پرائیویٹ سیکٹر کی ضرورت ہوگی سو وی ہیو ٹو گیٹ دا کمبینیشن رائٹ بٹوین دا پبلک اینڈ پرائیویٹ سیکٹر ان آڈر ٹو ورک آن ایچ آر ڈی ان دا ٹوینٹی فرسٹ سینچری یہ بڑا لازمی ہے تھرڈ چیز یہ ہے کہ ہمارا جو ایکو سسٹم ہے اس کو ہمیں انوالو کرنا ہوگا فورتھ انڈسٹریل ریولیوشن اس کو ہمیں اندر لے کے آنا ہوگا اس ایکو سسٹم کے لیے کہ واقعی ٹیک روبوٹکس یہ ساری چیزیں جو باقی دنیا میں اسکل سیر ابھی بلاک چین کی بات ہو رہی تھی اے آئی کی بات ہو رہی تھی ڈیجیٹلائزیشن کی بات ہو رہی تھی یہ ساری چیزیں ایسی ہیں جہاں دنیا اس طرف جا رہی ہے تو ہمیں ان کے لیے ایک سروس پرووائڈر بن سکتے ہیں تو رادر دین ہم جسٹ لکنگ ایٹ ان اسکلڈ اینڈ سیمائی سیمائی اسکلڈ ورکرز ہمیں یہ دیکھنا چاہیے کہ ہم اپنا ایکسپورٹ مین پاور بھی کیسے کر سکتے ہیں یا یہاں سے ایکسپرٹیز کیسے استعمال کر سکتے ہیں دیٹس پرابلی دا فورتھ انڈسٹری ریولیوشن ان ان ڈیجیٹلائزیشن وچ پاکستان لائک انڈیا نیڈس ٹو پک اپ آن سو دیز آر دا دا لوور ہینگنگ فروٹس اور دا دا آئیڈیالوجی وچ وی ہیو ٹو کائنڈ آف ورک ٹوڈز ان آڈر ٹو فکس دس گیپ دیٹ ور گیٹنگ اینڈ اٹس اے ویری ہائی گیپ وی ہیو ٹو انڈرسٹینڈ ایٹ ون پوائنٹ فائیو ملین پیپل اے ایئر از نو جوک ٹو فٹ ان ٹو دا ریمٹ تو آئی تھنک دا دا ٹین ملین figure of employment that the Prime Minister has given is absolutely accurate and that's where the government has to follow these paths. But a lot depends on it. Jo Pakistan ka abhi majuda jo structure hai, wo thoda sa um, may not be the best one at the moment. It needs revision. Um, HRD comes under me, but NAFTAC and TEFTA actually comes under the Education Ministry. So even that in itself is a, is a little bit of a confusing environment. NAFTA has to do a lot of work. NAFTAC, uh, TEFTA has to do uh, a lot of work which they are doing now. Pehli dafa, mein ye bhi bata dun ka, mein ek pehli dafa NAFTAC ke saath ek MOU abhi sign kiya interface ka, ki kitne waqi skill log hain uh, uh, Pakistan mein. They only produce, uh, they only have around 3,500 institutions, I think, around uh, the country, which is just not enough and it doesn't produce enough people. So, increase of that. I think NAFTAC has the most important role to play in this. Thank you. So, vocational and technical training is the one of our area which we are looking forward and looking for the public-private partnership, leveraging technology. Uh, and Leap Cyber, going, coming to your side, is you've been involved in a, in a teaching as well. You, you have a very close connection with the students, the current one as well, and you are managing the foreign ministry. You are part of that foreign ministry. How you see, like uh, uh, Zulfi Bukhari mentioned that, Rather than looking only on the Pakistan side, we should look outside as well where the, we can provide that type of skill and technology or, or technical skill. So what's your view and the role you can play in that overall HRD strategy formulation at this stage? Sajil, when we are talking about a national human resource development strategy, so it begins with the end. And we as a government, like uh, Zulfikar has shared with you, we have a very clear vision. PTI is based on development only and mainly through human development. We have a very clear agenda. Any development that is not based on human development is not sustainable, right? So that's the end. Now, in that end, the, we have to have a national HR strategy. And, uh, Zulfi and I have been discussing it a lot. What I feel is that, and uh, since I've been in the corporate sector, I keep on, uh, uh, I repeat the same thing. It, it applies on the government level as well, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Overseas, all ministries as well. The three Ps that we require. One is, of course, is it a passion? Or is it just lip service? Number two, the purpose behind it, why we are doing it, what we are doing for. And the number three is the planning implementation part. Now, these are all three. Uh, we have the passion. The, the Prime Minister and the Ministers are absolutely convinced this is the path. But then we have to convert that into three areas. When we talk about HRD in the government, HRD is only the semi-skilled and the technical 
workers. When we talk about HRD in the corporate sector, it's about the professionals, right? But they all play a part. So what we are looking at, and when we are in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, we see the best doctors, the best engineers, the best bankers going abroad in the world and getting absorbed in the best countries. Yet, there is a huge demand now coming for skilled workers all across the world. And there's a gap between what we are producing and what the world wants. What we are producing and what the corporate market wants of Pakistan. And we need to bridge that gap. So that's where we are looking at because you can have the best, you know, and a great vision without great people is a nightmare. A great plan without great people is irrelevant. So that's the problem with us, that we, we have the best talent in the world, but it's in bits and pieces. So the national HRD strategy, what I would recommend, and I've been recommending, and I've been talking to Zulfi about it as well, first of all, the corporate sector and the professional sector need to have a national institute of human resource management. Just like you have Aptima, just like you have uh, Pakistan Engineering Council, you need a body of human resource professionals who can work with us, with Zulfi, me, everybody, because we need to legislate on this. I'm a legislator. So I look at the uh, American model and I see that uh, with uh, Trump, the HR community is working to change the legislation. So if you want more women in the workforce, you want more women in the, in the corporate uh, boardrooms, you want more facilities for people, equal pay, the pay between the CEO and the pay between the lowest level, huge difference. If you want legislation to bridge that gap, that body has to interact with us and be part of the uh, national human resource development strategy. So that's the first challenge that I feel that we need to have a professional body and all of you are sitting over here, I'm sure you'll be able to help us in that as well. Second, very important part is the skill building that he talked about. We are, we're really struggling with that. Uh, Pakistan, like we, he said, we have about 3,557 training institutes all put together. We need about 200,000. We need about 200,000 to fulfill that gap. And then the type of skills that we need. That's what we need in the N, you know, the National Human Resource Development Strategy should be an APEC strategy, which should come up with the type of skills, capacities that we need. And working together with the government, that's most important. Once we come up, okay, we have three categories, the professional skills, the technical skills, and the general skills, you know, the drivers and the PNs, and then the technical skills, the IT guys, and then the professional skills, the, the professors and the bankers. So we need to identify the whole pyramid of the national HRD strategy, which fits in with the dream and vision of the prime minister of producing so many jobs. Because until and unless it is integrated, it will not yield sustainable results. No. Thank you, Nilip uh, I think it's important when we are talking about the, the strategy and we are talking about this uh, uh, overall direction. So we do take a little bit uh, uh, stock that where we stand today and what are the strategic uh, imperative at a national level. Khalisab, you are dealing with the, one of the largest logistic backbone in Pakistan as TCS, as chairperson of TCS, founder and chairperson of TCS, and you are touching almost a million people on an everyday basis on a different touch points. So what's your view, what are the strategic imperative at a national level once it's come to the human resources you are dealing with? Uh, Ji, thank you very much. <coughs> well, I think the tone that Ms. Andalip has set uh, resonates very well with the with the human resource challenge at a national level and when we talk of a human resource uh, challenge and the issue at the national level then we go beyond just the employability just the education or just an industrial uh, 
the aims of, at a national level, the human resource development policy of the most progressive countries of the world today, uh, and some of these policies are very recent. Um, they aim at they aim at improving and the harmonizing the lives of all segments of the population. Of course, the most important and critical are the people who are who are starting and who will shape or who will affect the future. Uh, but living in harmony and living productive lives. And some of the most progressive human resource policies that have come in very recent times, uh, the most recent in the last two, three years, I think one of the uh, good examples is, is Japan. In the year 2016, the Japanese cabinet approved us uh, a policy which they called Society 5.0. And that aims at integrating the, all the activities right from the beginning all the way through at making the, the life of people more productive and easier. So this kind of uh, activity then spans across all sectors of life and many ministries. I would have hoped that the, the present PTI government, whether it's, which is a very people-centric and is, I think I would have hoped to see a dedicated Ministry of Human Resource Development. Uh, and because the, the extent of the challenge is so vast. Now, the, let me just explain the extent of the challenge. There's a very beautiful song sung by a young uh, singer called Arib Azhar. And he, in that song, which is, I think, titled, Mere Des Mehe Imkan Bahot, As or Imkan Bahot. Mere Des Kehe Imkan Bahot, Umid As Arman Bahot. He has, in that beautiful three minute song, if you get to see it, has encapsulated the, the urban setting and the kind of a society that we have and what kind of a shortcomings and what, how it could be better. But mostly he focuses on the street children of Karachi. And then I saw a television documentary where a television uh, journalist had gone right into the interior of the country and in some very deep interior he's interviewing 10, 11 year olds. And these children, when you look at them, they look at the energy and look at the spark in their eyes. I mean, these are the children who have, many of them have the potentials of being Dr. Salam. Many of them have the potential of being fighter pilots and, and great icons. But they are deprived by this, by the, uh, by, the, uh, by the facilities that are not available to them. And the questions he asked them, he said, something about the geography of Pakistan, they didn't know much about. Then they asked him, do you know who, how was Pakistan founded? Who founded the Pakistan? Those children didn't know. And then he asked them, do you know who is the prime minister or the president of Pakistan? Those children didn't know. And, but they were playing and they were, and then he asked them, how, how do you think it is all this learning? And he says, Allah, Allah, that's the only thing. Now that is one of the great wasted potential of our country. These children, if, if harnessed, can be the real wealth because today the real wealth of a nation is not the amount of oil deposits or the gold deposits you may have. The real wealth now is our human resource and how well we can train and polish it. So I think this is the uh, imperative. But this kind of an activity, first of all, engaging those youth. And once you engage them, how do you engage them? And there are technology today, there are many methods of doing it, but then what do you tell them? And today the Minister of Education was here and I heard him. He had a very good grasp of the whole issue. And he also hinted that, you know, we should somehow, there are three different education systems in the country. There is the madrasas, there is the public education, and then there is the private education. Now all those three strands have to be connected. There has to be a common there has to be one national discourse, a national yeah. mission. It's very important that it's something that we should all agree on within the scope of our beliefs and within our systems and our, our, our plans in life, but there should be one singular thing. And I think when we come to the strategy of it, 
That is most important that the National Human Resource Strategy document should address A, what are we, how are we connecting to them? We can't connect to everybody today. How, what do we tell them? Okay, and how do we take them forward? The ultimate is, you see in the UAE, they have got a Ministry of Happiness. There's a Minister of Happiness. Now that is the ultimate when you've achieved all those. And then people have then started living lives. Then you go beyond just the basics to further improving the quality of their lives and their productivity. I mean, thank you, Khalid sir. Uh, and I think that that's great, uh, the very inclusive approach where we can talk about the work ethics, we can talk about the civic responsibility, integrity, objectivity, caring attitude, and above all, hope. And uh, hope is the one which drives the society in a different way. So from a human de development perspective, I think this hope, optimism, and then the work ethics, that's play a, a big role in, uh, in parallel to when we talk about the technical skill side of it. So that's bring me to, to asset up to your side. You, you are interacting with the youth, you are interacting on a, on a different policy framework uh, and the forums as well. And uh, you are working in the industry and you have seen the public sector to a certain extent. So if, if we ask you, in your opinion, the quality of human resource available in Pakistan and going forward, the, when we talk about the strategy side of it, and if we think in the, in the perspective of CPAC, when there's a more integration is going to happen with, the, with the China, so how it's going to impact, starting from what we have as a strategy today, or do we have one, and what quality it's producing, and how the integration with China will impact us further. Thank you, Sajid, uh, for that question. And uh, I must also appreciate, I think, uh, uh, having this conference, Pakistan Summit, on focusing on developing people. Because I think um, Pakistan's uh, biggest, I would say at the moment, weakness is also our human resource. Uh, we have huge population. Uh, we have fifth fourth, uh, sixth, now we are going to be fifth largest perhaps, even crossing Brazil. So fifth largest country in the world, uh, but in terms of uh, human development and uh, various indices, you know that we are at, uh, virtually at the bottom of the country, uh, bottom of the world, not only the, you know, on an overall basis, but uh, even when you compare Pakistan in the region, we are now in terms of, uh, our ratings in education, in health, and different uh, uh, rankings, we are uh, really in a worse situation. And I think it's, it's, we all know that uh, in this day and age, we had earlier, uh, the earlier session was on digital economy and digitization, but uh, how can you have digitization and compete in the world when our literacy rate is less than 60%. The minister, I think somebody talked about 60%, but actually in the last 10 years, unfortunately it has gone down from 60% to 58%. So in this day and age in 21st century, when we are talking about robotics and artificial intelligence and all that uh, terminology, if 42% uh, of our population is illiterate, and let me also give you a quote on this uh, aspect. Uh, 2,000 years ago, Plato said that a difference between an educated person and an uneducated person is the same as that between a living person and a dead person. So you imagine that 42% of our population but I mean, this is also defining literacy in a very loose manner. In terms, if you look at the actual number of people who can actually read and write and communicate, do bas basic maths, etc., I think the number of illiterates will be probably there. We are a country where majority of the people will come into that. So I think the biggest challenge for us to compete, whether it is CPAC or or whatever with this world 
is we have to enhance uh, the education and skill of our people. And what I would like to say to uh, Annette, I, you know, one was happy that, you know, the current uh, political party and the, uh, the PTI, which is uh, in the government, their focus was people and human resources. And uh, this was the difference between when you compared them with the other political parties because the previous uh, political party was in love with infrastructure, uh, with bricks and mortars, whereas we heard from PTI that they are in love with people. They want to change, bring a change for the people. But unfortunately, you know, so far, eight months have gone. Eight months is a very long time, by the way, because you only have five years and soon first year will be gone. Uh, we do not even have a strategy. And I think one of the takeaways I would suggest from this conference, we should generate some ideas. And one of the proposals that I would suggest to the Honorable Minister and uh, Madam Andalib, uh, the parliamentarian, that please at least think about developing a human resource, uh, human development strategy for Pakistan. You see, there are too many pro and we have to in when we are developing this strategy we need to analyze why we have failed to deliver you know i mean we know that the situation is bad so what are the we have to do a causal analysis in developing the strategy why we have failed to deliver we have been every government has been talking about education every government has talked about uh, you know uh, that education is an emergency, skill development is an emergency. You are everybody talks about it, but what have we done? And why we are in this state and how can we change? So we need a holistic, uh, uh, first of all, at least we should have a, a workable strategy, human development strategy. I mean, forget about the results. In the last 72 years, I, don't, I have not even seen a human development strategy. So I think I, I was expecting from PTI to develop at least in the first eight months, or maybe I think in the next four months, let's say in the first one year, if I think it will be a great achievement of this political party if we can come up with a comprehensive uh, but simple uh, you know, um, uh, human development strategy, obviously focusing on education, skill development and training. So that should be uh, one of the takeaways. And of, and of course, I can, I can go on and yeah. on on this. So I'll stop there. The first thought I would suggest is that, uh, f uh, you know, in order for our, our country to develop and take our people who are largely living in 19th century, uh, you know, 80% of our population uh, is living in 19th or early 20th century, we need to have a strategy to develop them. Now, thank you, Mr. Sab, and uh, we will come back uh, for, the, for the further comments that particularly, like in the, in the context of 18th Amendment, how we can develop that integrated strategy, and that would be a wonderful key outcome if we can bring something out on, on this one. But that's bringing me to Faraz. For, Faraz, you are an impact investor, you are a social entrepreneur, uh, and you are also delivering lectures in, in London as well. So given your view and experience, how you see the talent and the absorption equation working in Pakistan or around the world? Uh, we will come back to what the talents require because every country may have a different one. But how that equation should be working and how those verticals should be created. So what's your view around it? Thank you, Sajid. Uh, the challenge with having, um, is being on an esteemed panel and being the last one is that majority of the good points are taken by these wonderful people. But let me try, let me make an attempt. Uh, I have been fortunate to actually e experience a different kind of educational system in Pakistan and abroad. I was, uh, I came through this uh, Pila school uh, uh, education system, and I did my matriculation from there. Then went to a private school, a university, and then went to London and studied over there. So have experienced firsthand what happens 
Things have changed further. In some cases deteriorated, some cases improved. Um, and then by the virtue of being one of the largest impact investors in the country, uh, we work a lot with youth. And there are some learnings. First of all, I would like to uh, pick up from what uh, Asad has just mentioned. I, in detail, went uh, through the SRS policy and the stability, growth, and productive employment policy and the manifesto of the government. Um, first of all, congratulations, because for the first time, um, there seems hope. There's fantastic intent. But there are certain dichot di dichotomies that I kind of identified, and it is um, a constructive criticism that I hope you guys would take as. Number one, in both of these documents, which are quite recent actually, intention is brilliant, but like Asad said, the human resource strategy should have been a fundamental. And the data supporting that somehow is inconclusive. And all your employ employment policies and frameworks needs to have a collaborative and integrated approach, which at least uh, our, our analysts and ourselves, we could not kind of gather. So it would be great if we could actually have a conversation on that you know, at a later stage. The second bit is the supply and demand equation, very simple. So we have got 1.4, 1.5 million university kids coming out. The public and the private sector collectively absorb kitna percent kar rahe Achieving um, employment rates of let's say 10 million employment have generated kar diya. If you look at the UK model, I'll give you a very small example. UK has identified industries Agri-industry, tech industry, creative economy industry. Creative economy industry? Yes, they did an, an absolute amazing research, and they found out that 5% of the GDP contribution in the UK's economy comes from the creative economy. Fanun Latifa. And that's 60 billion pounds. They employ 1.3 million people. Now, that's the size. They have understood what is the economy size, what is the state of that particular economy, and what is the way forward. And that's how they're moving, that, that particular mini economy, which is contributing to the main economy. Now, I think, in my um, humble opinion, we need to actually take a community-led approach in order to assess, like Khalid Saab mentioned, the Society 5.0 model, in which what are the needs of education and status of education in rural areas, in Punjab, in Sindh, in various provinces? What is the status of the bottom of the pyramid education systems? And where we need to go, not only for our internal consumption, but where are we benchmarked against the global supply chain, global human resource supply? Because unless and until we look at that picture as well, we would always be kind of engulfed in our own circle um, and never look at care, how, how can we contribute to the global economy. The last bit is basically a very small part, but it is not a small part. Uh, the HRD strategy or SRS or you know, the stability, growth and productive employment needs to have mental health as a very critical part of the policy of our youth, of our urban youth, our, our rural youth, um, what are they feeling? There are a lot of suicide rates that have increased in up north, why? Now, unless and until we actually focus on mental health and make that an important part of the national HRD strategy, I think it will be um, incomplete. The second bit is the disability inclusiveness. Now, when we talk about employment, we talk about uh, education, uh, how come these two, you know, major important part of our communities and societies are not uh, a part of that. But that's just my two bit on. Thank you, Faraz. So if I just summarize and then I'll open the floor for, uh, for how we're gonna build that strategy in the context of 18th Amendment, the agenda is basically distributed among multiple departments if we come from a government side uh, and then 
Number one, what is the forum where that strategy can be formulated, number one? And then how it can be executed in a transparent way where the public, who is a major stakeholder in that, they can have a visibility. So just to summarize the conversation we had, there is a mental health conversation, the hope you, you mentioned, the work ethics and the integrity and objectivity we discussed, vocational and technical trainings we talk about as a one of a key priority, public-private partnership, that's a very encouraging side, technology side of it, and then definitely the benchmarking and the performance. So, Given that, if these are the things which we are discussing right now on the agenda, and primary education and the fundamental education, which is a constitutional right, that's basically a fundamental thing. So given that, if these are the key pyramid, or these are the key pillar for the strategy which we are trying to drive, which is leading to some economic well-being for the person, at, as well as the, the hope and the, uh, we call about the, the, the caring attitude side of it. So now I open it what we can do as a forum which can have a very integrated approach to deliver that strategy and number two what would be the the mechanism where we can have a transparency around the execution and if we look at all these things what are the two or three things which we should pick and talk about it which we can deliver in the next year two years and ten years so how we can really put those those priorities there so i'll open the um, the uh, uh, Zulfi Bukhari from your side uh, to, to, for, for to how you suggest that the forum, the transparency and the two or three key areas which we should pick from a, for a strategy delivery. First of all, some very good points, uh, some very valid points as well uh, from all the panelists. Um, the, the first and foremost thing is that when you try to, when you dissect a topic of uh, and when you're trying to dissect a topic, you know, you can take it at, at all lengths. And to, f to give a social infrastructure impact, I mean, Pakistan gives, what, like 2.2% and 0.9% towards education and health. I mean, that's the lowest in the entire region, not let alone in the world. So it's, it's right, 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 right at the bottom. So you can't have all of a sudden you know, growth and when we're talking about a holistic, happy sort of society, when you're living off 2.2 and 0.9% uh, of your GDP towards your social infrastructure. Obviously, the easy answer is we need to increase those numbers and in health and education and, those in, and then those departments need to then have a trickle down effect towards uh, the various aspects that were covered. But most of this most of these things, especially when we talk about skill base and when Fessel is talking about uh, employment outside of the country and what's going on in the world, uh, Pakistan needs to obviously, and as a ministry, we are completely changing our approach to that and we've now taken a demand-driven approach. We're creating, we've created five member cells with various countries uh, where, we are, where we are now working on where is that country going on, where is Qatar going in the next five to 10 years, 15 years, what's their approach? Which, which areas of society are they or in development infrastructure are they working on? And then we reverse engineer backwards and we make sure that Pakistan is prepared for those next five, 10, uh, 15 years. So I think the international approach when it comes has to, be become, has to become demand driven rather than supply driven, which unfortunately it always was. We were getting away with the easy times of having un, uh, unskilled labor going out to GCC countries. That's now, uh, unfortunately, coming to an end. So we need to up the ante and, and think for ourselves and actually have uh, skilled workers that are based, the skills, like I've at the very beginning said, that are based on demand-driven, which will be used rather than become obsolete. Um, I think forums, when it comes to, I think the one syllabus, uh, when, when Sir mentioned about the, having one syllabus across the board, I think that's an, that is the starting point, in my in my opinion. I'm not the education minister, like in uh, Mr. All the way through, that has to be the first implementation. We have done it in my OPF schools, where we're creating a one syllabus all across all the country for all the various OPF schools. It's impossible that you all you're going to all we've done or managed to do in the last 70 odd years is create a gap, and a gap in society because people are having different syllabuses to study in England. Professor touched upon in, in England how uh, how they for employment, but you got to understand in England your only decision is are you going to a public school or a private school, 
your decision isn't are you decide are you studying metric a levels o levels fsc uh, now there's a couple of other new ones as well uh, you know, that's not a decision that a, f a parent or a child has to make you just decide that do you have money to go to a private school or do you have money to go to a public school? or do you not have money to go to a public school so these are the only dis two decisions that a society makes which is a complete different ethos in your mind that you have when you're going towards educating a child and your whole when we talk about the happy element and all of this because it reduces the more more issues a human being has to think about more stress level there is it's, it's a general thing if you have a and b it's a very easy decision to make so i think my in my approach again not being the education minister my approach would be ke ek syllabus hona chahiye pehli cheez dusri cheez main fir se ye kehta hu ke and i again i'm not trying to sound repetitive lekin the term of education jo hum istemal kar rahe hain that needs to come into the 21st century it's very important we redefine that yes one of the elements is having one syllabus but there are various other elements of what we classify as education today um, i think so at the end discussed it that education is very different uh, uh, all over the world and what do we really determine between a literacy rate and a non literacy rate so these things have to move into the 21st century uh i'll just answer for pti uh, and the leave side i might want to as well but uh, when it comes to the human resource strategy there is a strategy being formulated it's it has taken longer than it should have there's no doubt but you know we need to realize that we've come into a 70 year old system ja voices were silent for so long now all of a sudden everyone has a voice and uh, we we have to uh, deal with it which is great lekin we only wish that these voices were there 70 years ago and on, especially in the last two decades that we had as many forums and as many voices and as much critique perhaps the governments that have left us with what we were left with would have started to work a bit better if they had the same sort of critique that alhamdulillah the pti uh, uh, party gets to face uh unfortunately the critique in between somewhat was sidelined and there was very few voices i think this is the first government that is uh like faisal said that we've given a plan and it's been well appreciated abroad and i think uh in uh, across the board lekin it's not the most perfect plan it needs improvements as we go along lekin at least this transparency ke hum yahan kuch karne aaye hain as the asas policy uh may need more work as he's mentioned absolutely uh we need more people like him to join in and the leap cyber at the very beginning opened up the floor ke kon hame uh madad kar sakta hai in this thing you have to understand you know it like i said it's how far you dissect it do i now try to put the onus that we have a capacity issue in the country the capacity you know if you look at all our dip, when you do, you don't see a country grow economically with high level of unemployment it all goes together when a comp when a comp uh, country is doing well economically unemployment lessens that's this is a natural thing the same way you don't do corruption by just destroying uh, just by filling your pockets corruption is destroying the complete all the elements in every single department that's corruption corruption isn't that someone made money on a particular infrastructure project corruption is the only way you can do it in my ministry if i want to be corrupt the only way i can be corrupt in my ministry is that i choose a corrupt, corrupt secretary i choose a corrupt dg i choose a corrupt md i can't just do it single handedly so what do i have to do i have to destroy my entire institution so when you are destroying an institution for decades when and you and you finish destroying it for decades and all of a sudden forget pti i'm just hypothetically speaking a new party comes in who decides that they're anti corruption they're left with this this crumble of basically filth that you've built up over the years that the previous governments have built up over the years now unme se hum kaun chune ke ji ye ye sachcha hai aur ye corrupt nahi hai aur ye nahi you you just left with no capacity so it's it's not only in one department it's across the board whoever thinks it's in one department is absolutely mistaken it's it's a corruption of morality across the board that stems into all parts of social society let it be unemployment and what have you i don't want to take everyone else's time so i'll pass on so anyways i think these things are the most important things which were which we are tackling day and night
No, th thank you, Zulfi. And I just like to add uh, to what uh, Zulfi is saying, and thank you very much for your comments. I completely agree with them because I've been on that side as well. Uh, my take on this, all these suggestions is, yes, like he said, there is a policy, but that policy needs to be strengthened. And guess what? Like we say, it's very easy to build a new building, but it's very difficult to try building something which has been systemically destructed. We are in a government which has systemic, by design, destruction. And so, for us, eight months, as you say, and I agree with you, in a corporate world, eight months would be three quarters of the year over, and then you have year-end results to be given. But in, in our case, let me tell you, even facts and figures that you're asking for, having a new survey, because even the surveys are rigged, even the data is rigged, and they don't know how to do the survey. The survey itself, to do a human resource survey, and we've initiated many of them, will take at least two years to come up with the right data and the right figures. So that's one, one problem. Second, even in the corporate world, and so many of you are sitting from the corporate world, and I'm from that corporate world as well, and I would like to say that human resource needs a paradigm shift, not just in the government, in the corporate world as well. I think there's a lot of lip service when you say that human resource is the most important resource. I have been on the other side. And I remember when I went to the CEOs, and sometimes when you give a requisition that, OK, your computer, for example, is, uh, has to be upgraded. And you give a requisition of a million rupees, and there is a system that you need to upgrade it with, he signs it. You go to the CEO, and you say, OK, this guy needs to be upgraded, because his knowledge is out of date. And OK, not a million but 100,000 training course, and the CEO has a heart attack. Are you familiar with this? Yep. No, I think yeah, so I just like to say that it's still in our part of the world, even in the developed uh, corporate sector, it's not an investment. It's a cost, because computers are reported in the balance sheet as assets. People are reported as cost in the profit and loss statements. And until and unless we don't change our systems, what he just said, the systems just doesn't mean that, you know, IT systems. We need to change our financial systems. We need to change a paradigm where we as corporate sector, individuals, and the government work together. And I would like to appreciate Sulfekar on this because I've suggested something, the answer to what you're saying. Uh, I came to him and I said, we need to have an HRAC, Human Resource Advisory Committee. And we need the best brains in the human resource of Pakistan to advise us. And he said, go ahead. So we'll be very soon getting the HREC together, the best uh, brains over here. And they'll be helping us toning up our policies, strategies, and everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Asad Sab, from your side, yeah. Uh, let me just um, give you a few suggestions, uh, you know, of what have worked in Pakistan. First of all, as I said, uh, coming back to this situation, we know that, uh, and Prime Minister has been saying this, that 22 million children out of 50 million children, school going age are out of school, right? Uh, so, and, and those who are going to school, majority of them are actually not learning. The outcomes are very, very pathetic. Uh, so obviously talking about 21st century skills is uh, uh, a big deal. Uh, my, uh, there is a strategy paper that um, uh, there is an education committee of a corporate group that we will present to you, um, as per which we have studied the education system of Pakistan. And we believe, and I believe, that existing system of education has not worked and it will not work. Why? I mean, for the simple reason, first of all, Jaysay, you said that the resources are less than 2 percent of the GDP education pe lagta hai. It needs to be increased. But even that 2 percent, 700 or 800 billion rupees that is spent in all the provinces and the federal government on both normal education and skill development, 70, 80 percent is wasted. The reason is that most of that money goes to the teachers. And the government teachers, as we know, in Punjab, uh, there are 50,000 schools. 
in Sindh there are 40,000 schools and the system is such that one secretary education sitting in Lahore or Karachi there is no way he can manage uh, and ensure better outcomes you know for, for in 40,000 schools it has to be school based so that's why London economists carried out a survey in 2015 and it, there, there's another one and there was a lead story that they covered Pakistan, India and many other third world countries and they concluded that education in public sector will not work. And Pakistan is a classical example, no matter what you do, the education system will not work, you will not get the outcome. And they said that the, one of the best systems which is already available is Punjab Education Foundation model. And now in Sindh also Sindh Education Foundation model. The difference is, let me just give you an example. In Punjab Education Foundation, your per child cost is 700 rupees. And in the public sector, the cost per child is 2000 rupees. So it's more than you know, double two and a half times. In SIN, it is 800 rupees for SEF and 3,500, by the way, for the public sector. So more than three or four uh, times the cost. Still, the outcomes of PEF and SEF when independent testing is done is double than that of the public sector. The reason is, that these organizations, this is public sector, SEF and P Punjab Education Foundation are also public sector, but these are outcome based. You know, these are public private partnership models, government funding and private execution. So what we are saying is this, we are a very resource, uh, we have a huge problem on fiscal side. You, we don't have too much money. We have to get better outcomes from the existing money. You can get these children who are out of school and provide better education by using Punjab Education Foundation model and Sindh Education Foundation model, providing a subsidy of 700 or maybe 1,000 rupees per child. And, you know, uh, and this system works because private sector, it develops the entrepreneurship also, and you only pay them when there are outcomes, when there is enrollment, when there is attendance, and when the results are better. Whereas in the public sector, you have hundreds of thousands of teachers who, are, who do not go to school, or if they go to school, they do not teach, or if they, even if they do, they do not, don't know how to teach, and many of them do not intend to teach also, they do other jobs. So there is absolutely no way you can correct this system. So if you really want uh, uh, better outcomes, and really want uh, delivery, I think we already have these systems. We have to reduce the government even otherwise. Thank and you, this, 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 will, uh, this applies to all sectors. All sectors. No, so thank, cut thank the you. government, do public-private part, uh, partnership, and, and you know, uh, do a management which is outcome-based rather than input-based. No, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll bring Khalid Saab and Faraz very quickly, briefly. The, any anything which you feel that is a key pillar for our strategy. There are things which are already said, so if you can add on those. Khalid, I'm starting from you. Uh, Jim, <coughs> very quickly, I just want to take uh, the advantage of the presence of some of two very senior members of the government, and uh, just uh, very much from the heart. Uh, the issues are there. Uh, we recognize the issues. Uh, the fact that you are there means that you have to be bigger than the issues. and. So Problems loom large where men don't, and issues are there. And you also have now at your disposal an array of tools which were not previously there. The tools of communication is a great tool. Today you can reach and say, and then what you have, the present government has in the person of the present prime minister, his personal charisma, his appeal, his effectiveness, his ability to reach right to across the cross-section of the people, you know, with the right narrative, he can shape a whole new thinking of this country. We heard this morning uh, the national anthem. Everybody stands up for the national anthem and says it from the heart. In the corporate world, when companies deal with very complex issues, we draw up what they call a mission statement. 
in a mission statement, in a three, four liner, we say who we are, what we want to do. First, who we are, we must define what we want to do, a value system of how you'll do it. That simple thing then defines, makes everything else clear. And I think you, the team, and the government today, with the leader that you have, and with the short time that you have, because time flies so quickly, I think I would very much appeal to you to have a national narrative that is across the board. The madrasa child accepts it as much as the students of LUM. This will be a common narrative, and that has to be articulated and implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid, sir. For us, anything you want to add? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, majority of the things have been said. Uh, I just want to request that I think it's high time we should not go with this antibiotic approach in which, uh, you know, one particular system, one, one particular curriculum is important, but you need to understand that the education requirement, the skill set requirement in rural Sindh would be much different from urban KPK, from very different in Galiat and very different in, in, in Shikarpur. So uh, we need to have, th it's really great to know that there is serious data accumulation exercise that is happening in the government because unless and until we know the, what is the real state of affairs, we won't be able to formulate any kind of serious steps. And if that data is coming from the communities, from the schools, from the bottom of the pyramid, urban and rural, then I think we'll be in a great position to formulate uh, uh, a fantastic strategy at the center and then actually disseminate it through either public-private partnership, outcome-based, those are, those are secondary things. But having access to the real data and then formulating um, our strategies on that is critical. Thank you, Faraz. And just to summarize that the key pillar which we picked up is the there is an area which is moved on more demand-driven one. That's a key pillar for the strategy. Curriculum review in terms of the standardization as well as the content, what the education means in terms of the scale, in terms of the behavior, and in terms of the technical and vocational side. Uh, teacher's capacity, like uh, Asasa picked up that, that's an important one, what they are exactly doing, what's happening there and Khalisab came up with the narrative building. And from an execution side, the things which I picked up is the data validation, that's one side. Technology is another one. And public-private partnership, which is very much outcome-driven, like uh, Zulf Sab, you mentioned earlier as well, and Asad Sab built on. The one thing which is missing right now, we are talking about HRAC, the forum, because with the 18th Amendment, there is so complexity in terms of the execution that who will make those decisions. I think that's a one area which we have to figure out that what is the level where this activity should start. Ideally, if we don't have anything, it will start with the Prime Minister. And then from an execution perspective, we have to see how the departments should be engaged, involved, and effectively how we monitor that. The, the execution and monitoring is the, is the last part. So from here, I'll thank all the panelists for may their... I, may I their just uh, touch base on 18th Amendment? If you... I'm sorry, we have, we've run out of time. I'd like to request... No, no, just, I think, just very briefly, I think this is a serious issue that... Uh, in, through 18th Amendment, effectively, all the as even the word education is not there in the federal list. You know, uh, education, health, and all, entire human development is provincial subject. I personally think that uh, while it is good to devolve this and the provinces execution, I am not against 18th Amendment, but there should be some role in the federal government. Uh, like that of uh, at least planning and uh, coordination and strategy formulation and taking a cohesive approach, taking the provinces together, you know, yeah. so that should have been there. At the moment, I'm afraid that, you know, the education department, which is there, or even the human resource uh, department, it is not consistent with the constitution, the legislature. There is nothing in the federal uh, legislative list, part one or part two, even the word education is not there. Just the, they talk only about the standards and you know very restricted thing, uh, sense. Thank you so I very think much. that's one of a challenge which we have to overcome definitely. So thank you very much. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. A big round of applause for our panel on developing a national HR strategy. <laughs> I'd request the panel to stay on the stage. I would like to invite Senator Anwarul Haq Kakar to come onto the stage and present a token of appreciation to the panelists. If Asfar and Ali can also please join us on the stage. Thank you.
Okay, I'm announcing the names in no particular order. Sayyid Zulfikar.